Praise God. I just want to speak to you on this topic. Strength made perfect in weakness. Strength made perfect in weakness. Hallelujah. Our text tonight is found in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 9. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 9. And it says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Sorry, 2 Corinthians, my bad. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Praise God. Thank you for standing. You may be seated this evening. Hallelujah. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Hallelujah. You know, if we were to have a poll in this place for people's preference in, would you rather be strong or weak? Would you rather be strong or weak? Pick one. I would be very confident that it would be skewed towards being on the strong side. I don't think that people want to be weak. I believe that it's everyone's desire to be strong. Nobody wants to be weak. I don't know about you, but I've never been to a gym or driven past or walked by a gym and they had an advertising material which says, Come to a gym and we will guarantee that you will get weak in no time. I've never seen that. It'd be really weird. Also, I've never seen an advertising which says, you can't lift. Neither can we. Come in and join us. I've never seen that. It would be really funny, though, if they had that. Or another one, we skip leg day too, so come along. <laughs> if you understand gym language, you would understand that, that you try not to skip leg day. My brother understands that you're not to do that. Don't skip leg day. You know, they don't put up posters of, of scrawny guys. And the only time they would do that is when they have a big muscly guy next to that one saying, you can look like this if you come to our gym. And, you know, there's a big buff guy, someone like Arnie, someone big, so that they encourage you, I want to look like that. You know, when we look at somebody, it's easy to, to see that they're strong, that they are physically strong, because you can see that. You can see that outward appearance. You can see that that person has been hitting the gym, if you will, and they're, they're really fit. You can, you can tell, even though they're wearing all these baggy clothes, you can, know, you can still see the definition. Brother Mark, if you're watching, you're that guy, if he's watching online right now. But physical strength doesn't always reflect what's going on on the inside. Physical strength, I'm going to say it again, physical strength doesn't always depict what it looks like for you on the inside. Because there are many, many physically strong men and women, but in their minds they're physically weak. Sorry, they're, they're weak in the mind and, and they're weak in the spirit. But you see, when we look at strength, what is the purpose of, of strength? What is the purpose of being strong? Well, we understand that strength is power. There is power in strength. So when, when you see somebody that, that is strong, when they, when they are really big and, and muscular and they've got all this strength on them, you know that they're able to overcome somebody that is not so strong. And you look at me and you look at Arnie, Arnie would take me out straight away back then. He, he may still do it now. He's still quite big. But when you see somebody that's physically strong, you know that they can overpower somebody else. And I remember when I was little, give you a little story. Uh, I was back in the Philippines, and I think I was about five years old at this time. And I remember playing uh, near the basketball courts, and there was this guy who was, of this kid, who was about a year or two older than I was. And I think we got into a bit of an argument, and I, I think I might have started it. I have to agree. I might have started it. But anyway, he was really annoying to me. So I had a bit of a fight with him, but he was stronger than I was. So he came up and, and, you know, started to take me down, started to beat me up a little bit. And then out of nowhere, my brother jumps the fence and he sees all this happening. He jumps the fence and beats up the guy. And, I'm, and I, was, I was so glad because he was, he was beating me up. 
And, and so my, my brother um, came in and, and he handled business. And I was so happy that he did. And I always will remember this and he will always be my hero for that. I like to tell this story to, to, to people. He'll, he'll always be my hero. He hasn't done that for a while. So uh, watch out, everybody that tries to pick on me. I got a big brother that's going to mess you up. <laughs> but you see, I wasn't strong enough to handle my own business. But thank God my brother was at that time. Now, praise God, we're friends with that guy. I don't know where he is now. It was a long time ago. My mom probably remembers that, that boy. But I wasn't strong enough to handle my business, but there was someone that was strong enough. And my brother was, and it commanded respect, especially for the, for the bully. Now, when you have strength, you have, you have power. When you have strength, you have power. And when we look at, when we look at power... And strength, it, it is very important. You know, history shows us that nations and empires which had great strength, and when they had greater strength than all those around them, they became the conquerors. We know that history is, is made by, by champions or by, by the, stronger, the stronger nation. We understand that. But you see, there, there is something about strength and power. See, wars were won. And wars are won by the side which has the greatest strength. Wars are won and were won by, by, by countries and, and nations which have the greatest strength, have, have a bigger and, ha, and a stronger uh, military force, have, have better equipment, have better machinery. They overpower other people. They are able to conquer others because they've got that great power. And sadly, when we look at our own history... Very recently, there have been certain people who use that great strength and great power to commit heinous atrocities and crimes. And we look at our early history and we can recall the Holocaust and how tragic and how dark that was to see all these things that were happening to the Jewish nation, to the Jewish people that were taken captive. It was such a dark time, but you see, it was the nation which had power at that time who brought other nations to their knees because they had that strength. They had power. And when we look at our own nations today, when we look at our time today, we understand that there are powerful people and powerful organizations that can silence anyone or silence something if they choose it to happen. And it's quite scary to, to think that they have such great power and they have such, such a might that they can just easily do these things. But when we're really looking at it with an with a overall perspective, we, we are talking about the strength of man. We're talking about the strength of humanity. And as strong as that might be, and we're not talking about spiritual at this moment. But as strong as that might be, it cannot be compared to the strength of God. I'm going to say that again. As strong as that might be, the strength of certain organizations, the strength of one man who controls certain organizations, certain armies, how, how strong some dictators have great authority and they have great power and they can command certain things to happen and it will happen. If they want a certain nation to be destroyed, it can happen in an instant. We've got all these technologies, we've got all these weaponry that can, can destroy whole nations and cities, countries even. One push of a button and, it, and that can happen. But you see, as strong and as scary as that might be, we're looking at the strength of man, but it cannot be compared to the power of God. Hallelujah. It cannot be compared to the power of God. We understand that at the mention of the name of Jesus, hallelujah, at the mention of the name of Jesus, all things are possible. Things can happen. Mountains move. Why? Because it's the strength of God. It's, it cannot be compared. To the strength of man. Hallelujah. So we ought not to fear. We ought not to fear what man can do. But we need to fear what God can do. We need to have great reverence and respect for what God can do. In Psalm 26 to 8. 
Psalm 26 to 8, it says, Now I know, now know I that the Lord saves his anointed. He will heal, hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. For some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. And this is what he does. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. There's something about the power of God. You see, some of these men, they trust in chariots. They trust in horses. They trust in their weaponry. They trust in their army. But we remember the name of the Lord. Why? Because it's so much more powerful than anything heaven on earth, than in heaven on earth. Hallelujah. It's powerful. We remember the name of the Lord. We don't need to fear what man can do. Neither, neither do we need to fear what, what Satan can do or the devil can do. Because God is on our side and he is the almighty one. Psalm 24, 7 to 8. Hallelujah. Psalm 24, 7 to 8. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Hallelujah. The, the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in what? In battle. Hallelujah. Whatever comes our way. Hallelujah. We don't need to fear because the Lord is mighty. And the Lord is mighty in battle. Hallelujah. That means he fights for us. He fights for you and I. Hallelujah. Whatever comes our way. He is mighty. You know, there are times when we do feel weak, and I know that for myself. And when we, when we remember, and when we, when we think about it, it's, we see that sometimes the, the storms of life come, and, and we feel battered by these things that come against us. But in those times... We need to lift up our eyes. We need to lift up our eyes and look to our God because he is our strength. Hallelujah. We need to look to our God. Hallelujah. Because he is our strength in a time of weakness, in a time of desperation, in a time of, of feeling overwhelmed, uh, when we don't understand, uh, when we are confused, uh, when we cannot see a way out. Hallelujah. We need to look up. And look to our God. Hallelujah. In 1 Samuel 17, we, we read about a, an incredible story. A famous story. One that has been made into movies and books have been written and plays have been made by, about it. And we read about David and Goliath. The underdog versus somebody that isn't. Someone that is a conqueror, if you will. Now in 1 Samuel 17, and this is where it's found. Israel is assembled together with, with the, the Philistines and they're assembled for war. And, and this is found in the Valley of Elah. And with the Philistines, they, they had a mighty warrior. A mighty warrior named Goliath. He was their champion. It was a strong man. It was a mighty man. And it was really big, so that really helped. It was really big. It was nine feet tall, to be exact. That's, that's really tall. I don't know if you met Brother David. He was six foot six. We all had to look up at him. He was six foot six, but Goliath was nine feet tall. That's even taller than that. Goliath was the Philistine's champion. And, and the children of Israel were fearful when they saw him. And, and this Goliath had so much confidence in himself. He had so much confidence that he's so big. And, and I, would, I would say that any foe that went against this man would have fallen at his feet. Because he's so big. He didn't even need any weapons. He, he could have just grabbed them and, and would have done some... Terrible things with that, with just one hand. It would have been scary to, to see. 
But he had great confidence in himself, and you see it when you read the account. He was so boastful and he was so proud of himself that he is so, he's so powerful. He, he felt that no one could stand against him. In 1 Samuel 17, 8 to 10, we, we read about what he says. This is what Goliath said. And, and if, you, if, you see the, if you get a picture of what's happening, the Israelites are on one side and the Philistines are on the other side. And between them, there's a valley. That's the valley of Elah. And Goliath would come out from the Philistines and he would go to, to, the, to, to the Israelites and he would say all these things. And this is what he said, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and your servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Give me a man that we might fight together. See, at this time, at this point, the, the children of Israel were seeing this massive man, huge. And the army of Israel were so afraid. And quite understandably so. And if you, if you can imagine being in their position, for me, if I saw this, I would most likely be fearful. This, this guy would, would most likely have killed so many men in battle. And so they were so fearful of this, of this giant. And the thing that made it more scary, if you will, was that Goliath did this for, for 40 days, the Bible tells us. For 40 days he would come before Israel and, and say these things and, and, and defy the armies of Israel. For 40 days, but, but you see, the children of Israel didn't have an answer for him. They didn't have an answer. But, but David, we read about this young boy named David... He was instructed, instructed by his father to go and, and see his brothers who were in the army. And so David, after being instructed by his father Jesse, went to, to give food to his brothers. Because they'd been there for 40 days and they must have not had any food or not very many. And so David goes with, with the food that he has and he hastily goes to them. And when he gets to the camp of Israel... He hears all that Goliath is saying. All these cursings and all these things defying the armies of Israel. All these heresies that he's saying. And so something stirs up inside of David. Something begins to stir up in him. As Goliath is, is speaking his words, David is hearing it. And it's, and it's working him up. There's something stirring in his soul. And David turns around to the people that is close by and he says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine to defy the armies of the living God? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? But his older brother who hears him talking all this, he tells David off. And he says, I know that you're naughty. You just wanted to come here to see the battle. I know that. But, but David turns around and tells Eliab, no, what have I done now? Isn't there a cause? Isn't there a cause? And David continues on and tells more people, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine to defy the armies of the living God? And so he tells another person, and he tells the next person, and that next person tells another person. See, he was the voice of hope. In a, in, a, in a place which had no hope. They were hopeless. See, for 40 days, for 40 days, Goliath was going out before the children of Israel, defying the armies of the living God, saying, who out of all you can fight against me? He was basically saying, there's no one there. There's no one to challenge me. 
But along comes David and hears these things. And he says, who is this guy? Who is this guy saying all these things, defying the armies of the living God? And so when this word was, when it reached Saul, King Saul, King Saul brought David to him. Isn't it crazy the king would bring a young boy to him? Why? Because there was something about what David had in his heart. See, Saul wanted to hear that because they were in a hopeless situation. But there was one man that was saying, no, there's something greater than this guy. There's something greater than this. See, he's defying the armies of the living God. See, were the people around about, the armies, were they saying this? No, they were shaking. They were shaking in, in their armor. They were shaking for fear of Goliath, but David was something different. And so when Saul heard this, he called for David. And David talk, talks to King Saul and he says, why are the people fearful? Why? Don't let them fear. I'm going to fight. Let your servant fight this guy. David didn't go, well, I know this guy. He looks pretty big. He might be able to fight him. No, he said, no. Your servant, me, I will go fight. I'll fight him. But, but Saul turns around and tells David, well, you can't fight. You're just a youth. You're too young. See, see Goliath, that guy, that giant of a man, he's been fighting since you, as, as young as you were. But look how, how big he is now. He's been fighting since his youth, but you're just a youth. Well, you can't fight, but... But David tells him, David tells him of all that he had done with the help of God. He said, King Saul, I was tending my father's sheep. And the lion came and the bear came to try and take away one of the flocks. And when the lion and the bear did that, I chased after those lions and, and took that, that sheep from their mouth. And when that lion came back and, and tried to attack me, when that bear came back and tried to attack me, I grabbed him by its beard and struck him and killed him. You see, King Saul, this God that I serve, that brought me out of the, of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear is going to deliver me even against that giant of a man out there. He's going to deliver me. See, he had great faith in God. Why? Because he had an experience. He had an encounter with God. Hallelujah. But he, David had something in his heart. Who was this guy who would defy the armies of the living God? Who was he? And when you see the words of David later on. Now, eventually, King Saul is convinced to send David out to go and fight. They must have been really desperate. Or David was very convincing because he was just a young boy. A, a youth. A youth. Not a little boy. But he was quite young, and as Saul pointed it out. But you see, Saul was convinced to let him go, and, and Saul gives him his armor. All right, you can have this armor, David. And so David puts that armor on, and when he put it on, he said, No, I, it, I haven't proved this yet. It, it, it's, it's not good. So he takes it off without any armor, and he goes out to battle. And so David goes before Goliath, and, and, and we read this in 1 Samuel 17, 40 to 47, 43 to 47. And it says, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog? Am I a dog that you come to me with staves, with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me. And I will give your flesh unto the fowls of the air. Can you imagine this giant of a man speaking to David? Come here. And I will give your flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. But you see, that just went past David. It didn't get to him. David said in verse 45, you come to me. 
with a sword and with a spear and with a shield but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel whom thou you have defied this day will the Lord deliver you into my hand and I will smite you and take thine head from you and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air. It wasn't just about Goliath. He said, see the rest of your people, I'm going to give their carcasses to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That they might know that there is a God in Israel. See, they were shaking to the, to the knees. Uh, that the children of Israel were scared out of their wits. But you see, David had so much faith. Uh, he had so much faith in God that he was not about to let a, a, a giant defy the true God. Hallelujah. See, Goliath was cursing David with his gods. But you see, David knew who the real God was. Uh, hallelujah. He knew where the power was coming from. Uh, he knew where strength lies. David said that they might know that there is a God. Where? In Israel. In Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with a sword and spear, not with a sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and then He will give you into our, our hands. Hallelujah. And what did David have? He had stones. He had some pebbles. And so when Goliath was ready to attack, David grabs that, that stone and that sling, and he, and he, and he, and he uses that, and he goes straight to Goliath's forehead. And the Bible tells us that it sinks inside his head, in his skull, and he falls down dead. And David finishes him off later on with his own, with his own weapon, takes his head off. It's graphic, but that's what happened. But you see, when we look at this story, we see the, the children of Israel. You can honestly say, well, yes, they were very weak. They were very weak. They were, they were very scared. They were weak. But when we look at David, he was weak too. When we're looking at it from the physical sense. There was no way that he could stand up against a, a man of, of that caliber. No way. See, this man was proven in battle. He had all this experience in, in warfare. David was weak and we're looking at it from the physical sense. But David did not rely on his own strength. Because if he did, he would be shaking, just like the rest of the guys. But he relied on the strength of God. He relied on the power and the strength of God. See, David had a different perspective. David had a different perspective. See, when everybody else was seeing this man, all that they could see was how big he was, how strong he was, all the, the weapon which he had. All they were seeing was the physical. But you see, David saw beyond that. And his perspective was different. He understood that, that if God was able to deliver him from the lion and the bear, he was surely going to deliver him out of the hand of this giant. And deliver him, he did. Amen. Hallelujah. We need to change our perspective. We need to, we need to change our, our, our thinking. See, when, when we are faced against an insurmountable problem, yes, we can acknowledge that we are weak in that sense, but we need to understand that just because I am weak, God is not weak. Just because I am able to do it, God is able to do it. See, how His strength is made perfect in my weakness because when I can't do it, hallelujah, God is able to get me through. God is able to fight my battle. Why? Because the Bible tells me that He is mighty and He is mighty in battle now it's not a, a battle that we fight against flesh and blood uh, hallelujah but we're fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places hallelujah rulers in darkness 
We're fighting against these things. But you see, where I am weak, he's strong in me. Hallelujah. Where I am weak, he's strong in me. See, we may not be able to do it. But if God can, then I am able. Hallelujah. If we just believe in the power and strength of God. Hallelujah. All things are possible. In Isaiah 40, 29 to 31 Isaiah 40, 29 to 31, it tells us he gives power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young man shall uh, utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And what else? They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He gives power to the faint. And to them that have no might. He increases strength. When we feel like we're at our wit's end, uh, when there's no way out for us, uh, we can rely upon God, who is the source of strength, uh, who is the source of power, who is the source of might. Uh, hallelujah. We can rely upon Him because He has all power and authority. See, so when we're with God, nothing can ever stand against us. He is so powerful. In Habakkuk 3.19, Habakkuk 3.19, the Bible says, The Lord God is my strength, and He will make my feet like hind's feet, and He will make me to walk upon mine high places. The Lord God is my strength, and He will make my feet like hind's feet. Hallelujah. We may not be able to do it on our own, but by the grace of God, but by the grace of God, we will have the victory. We will have the victory because He is our strength. You know, there's some things that we come, uh, come against, that comes against us, that we are in no control of. And we don't understand why these things happen, but quite clearly, the Lord allows certain things to happen in our lives. And when these things come, and, and it's not pretty sometimes, and we are weakened by these things. But you see, these things happen for a purpose and a reason. And we read about a man in, in, in the scripture who had it really bad. Who could imagine what it was like for this man? And we read about a man named Job. See, Job had ten children. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he had great possessions. He had much livestock. And it came a time, the Bible tells us, that, that Satan was walking to and fro in the earth. And he has a conversation with God. And God presents Job to Satan, and he says, Have you considered my servant Job? And he presents all the accolades, he, all the things that Job did well. He issued evil. He was upright. He did all these things. But Satan tells God, well, well the only reason he's serving you and he's doing all these things is because you put a hedge around him. Everything he does, you bless. So that's the reason why if he didn't have all these things, then he would curse you to your face. That's the only reason why. He's got all these things and you protect him. Get rid of all these things and he will curse you. And so God allows Satan to take away all of Job's possession as well as to take away his children. And when Satan got the A-OK, -okay, he does all these things. And he clearly doesn't have much patience. He didn't wait very long to, to harm the things of, of Job, to take away Job's possession and all his livestock. One after the other, he lost all these things. 
One after the other, he lost, loses his camel, he loses his sheep, he loses all these things. And, and his servants were killed as well that looked after all these. But the worst news that he heard and was delivered to him was to hear that his children were all killed. After there was a, the house of one of the brothers collapsed while they were there. What a terrible news that would have been. See, he had, he had heard of all these things. Yes, it would have been bad to lose all these livestock. It would have been terrible. But to hear that all his children were taken away just by this, it would have been such a terrible, terrible time. And in Job chapter 1, we read what Job did. In Job 1.20, it says, then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and he was so sorrowful. Yes, he was, but it tells us, and worshipped. He fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Verse 21, and said, naked Came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, and not, nor charge God foolishly. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charge God foolishly. Even all these things that had befallen upon Job, he managed to still find the strength to worship God. And when we read in the next chapter, when Satan didn't see the, the reaction that he wanted to see, because Job didn't curse God, another conversation takes place between God and Job. Sorry, God and Satan, rather. Now, this time... Satan was able to, to wreak havoc on, on Job's body. But he was instructed by God not to kill him. He could do anything to Job, but not kill him. Save his life, God says. So when we read what happens next, Job is then tormented with, with boils from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. And all he could do was scrape the boils to find some sort of comfort, to scrape all the boils, to, to find relief. Yet, in everything that Job went through, he did not sin nor charge God foolishly. Even when his friends were accusing him continuously that he must have done something wrong that he must have sinned against God to receive all this punishment. He was accused by his friends. And, and even his wife said, why do you continue in your own integrity? Why? Just curse God and die. That's not very loving. You see, in all of that, Job did not sin nor charge God foolishly. But we, we read that that Job complained quite a lot. He complained a whole lot. And, and understandably, you would, you would say, because of all the things that he had gone through, he even cursed the day he was born. But in all this, you see, he would have been such a broken man. All his strength which he had, before all this calamity came upon him. All that strength is no longer there. But you see, he had enough strength not to sin against God. And so throughout Job's complainings and questionings about God, God then speaks to Job out of the whirlwind and says, Job, where were you when I did all these things? Are you able to do this? Are you able to do that? No, you can't, Job. God reveals to Job all the things that God is able to do. God demonstrates his might in Job. Because you see, Job had no strength left. 
He didn't have the strength left to, to deal with all these things. But the end of Job's, when we read the account in Job, we see that all those things that Job had lost, God returned to him double. All the possessions which he had lost, he gained double and he was restored his children. He had 10 kids once more. He had the same seven sons and, and three daughters. God blessed him. But you see, in the moment, in the weakness of, of where Job was at his, at his lowest, God speaks to him and reveals to him all these things to demonstrate to Job, I have all power, I have all authority. Hallelujah. And sometimes uh, we might not go through the same things as Job went through. And thank God for that. God forbid that anything like this ever befalls us. Uh, but you see, even in that place of weakness, uh, even in that place of, of sorrow, in that place of sorrow, God is able to come through. Hallelujah. See, when we're in that lowest in our lives, when we are in that position, we can see that God never looks away or turns away. Hallelujah. But God is our strength. And if we just call out to Him, hallelujah, He'll be there to help us. Because we understand that He is our strength. He is our um, mighty God. Hallelujah. He's the almighty God. And He's able to come through for us. You see, Job was able to keep his integrity. He was able to have enough strength to do that. And sometimes when we're in our weakest point, we can start to doubt all the things that we have heard of, all the promises that we find in the Scriptures, all the beautiful words that we find when we're up against our, our problems. We can start to put that aside. I don't know about you, but I start to think these things. I'm just a human being. But you see, when, when I'm faced with, with, with problems, I start to, to doubt some things. Perhaps maybe that word is not meant for me. Maybe that promise is not meant for me. But when I go back uh, to the word, uh, when I get down on my knees, uh, when I cry out to God, uh, He never fails. Uh, hallelujah. He never fails to answer my prayers. Uh, hallelujah. He's never failed me before. Hallelujah. And He will never fail me in the things to come. Hallelujah. Who believes that this morning? Hallelujah. He is mighty. Hallelujah. When we're going through certain things, we can rest assured that we can trust in our God. We can trust in Him through our problems, through our trials, through our turmoils, through calamity. We can rely on God. Hallelujah. Some men trust in chariots. Some men trust in horses. But we Remember the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. We trust in God. We trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. When we look at our text from the, from the beginning, where it says that my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When you look at that account, we understand that the Apostle Paul went through certain things. And this, uh, this scripture, he's talking about that he had a thorn in the flesh. He had a thorn in the flesh that he could not get rid of. And he sought God three times. He sought God thrice to get rid of this issue. But you see, God did not take that away. But you see, God was, the Lord Jesus was trying to show the Apostle Paul that his grace was sufficient enough for him because in his weakness, the strength of God would be evident. And when we continue to read that scripture in verse 9, it says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. For what cause? For, the, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Why was he strong when he was weak? Because he understood the power of God. He understood that through his weakness, 
the strength of God was upon him. There are certain things that we cannot control. But you see, that's when we need to rely on the power of God. There are things that come against us that we just don't understand, but that's when we need to get on our knees and trust in Him. When we pray, we pray in faith, knowing that He's able to do it. He is more than able to do that. Now the Apostle Paul went through some, a lot of things. He was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was bit by a snake, he was persecuted greatly. But you see, he trusted in the Lord through, his, through, through all that he went through. We, we remember an account in the scripture about a man that was possessed by a legion of demons. We read about that demoniac. You see, he was tormented day and night and, and he lived in the tombs. And the people would try and, and, and bind him up with fetters and chains. But he would just break out of them anyway. And he was ostracized. He was a castaway. And you see, there was nothing that he could do to get out of his situation. He was not in control of all those things. He had a legion of demons that was inside of him. And so there's, there was no amount of strength of man that could take him out of there because he was in a spiritual battle. He was in a spiritual battle. But you see, along comes Jesus. And when their ship crosses to the Gadarenes, this man that was living in the tombs comes running, comes running to the feet of Jesus, and he worships. He had enough strength. Uh, no amount of legion was going to stop him from worshiping God. He worshiped Jesus at this time. And when we read the rest of the account, we, we read that Jesus delivers him from, from this torment. But you see, he was in a place of weakness. There was nothing that he could do out of his situation. But it was in his weakness that the strength of God was evident. It was through his weakness that we can see the evidence of the power of God. There was no amount of, of human power. There was no amount of intervention by, by flesh that could take this man out of his problem, out of his predicament. But out come, comes along Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is the mighty God, hallelujah, in Christ, revealed, hallelujah. He has all power and authority and at the mention of his voice to these legions, they were out of there. Because you see, he has power and authority. He has power to, to, to command the physical things in this, in this earth uh, to, to change forms. And, and he can command the, the stars to be formed. He can command the winds to stop. He can command the storms to cease. Hallelujah. And he can also command the, the demons to flee. Hallelujah. There's no amount of power that man can do to, to be able to do that. He's Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah. So when we we are in our weakness, though it might be, it might be in the flesh, uh, if it's something spiritual, we know that there's one man that can help us. There's one man that's, that's more than qualified to help us, uh, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? Uh, hallelujah. When you need something that the doctors can't answer, that, that no amount of money can fix, uh, aren't you glad that when you call the name of Jesus, uh, which is higher than any names, uh, which is the name above all names, when you call that name, aren't you glad that the, the God of all gods, hallelujah, that the King of all kings answers by that name and he comes to your aid, hallelujah. I'm so thankful today. I'm so thankful that when we call out the name of Jesus, I'm so thankful that when I get on my knees, when I can't see a way out, when I feel that there's walls all around me, that I just call out the name of Jesus and I have faith enough to believe that all things are possible to them that believe and know that when I call that name all things change for good amen hallelujah aren't you glad tonight that you serve a God that is able to command hallelujah the, the demons to flee that that at, at at his name the sick are healed the dead rise hallelujah See, in our weakness, his strength is perfected. 
Because when we can't do something, he's able to do it. See, what's impossible for man is possible with God. So I don't know what you came here with tonight. I don't know your situation. But if you're in that place tonight where you feel so weak and you feel like there's no way out, I'm here to tell you that he makes a way where there is no way. He makes a path straight where it's not straight. He's able to, to guide and lead you. He's able to see a difficult situation turn out for good. Hallelujah. If the musicians would come tonight, I'm coming to a close. We serve a God that is able to do all things. And when we are weak, He is strong. When we are in our weakest times, in the weakest moments, He's able to lift us up out of the miry clay. And the greatest thing that He could do was to take us out of, of the life that we used to live. That, that, that emptiness, that empty life where there was no hope. But you see, he's able to make a way out of no way. And if we, we can all stand this evening. See, the Lord is so good to us. He's so full of grace and he's full of love. And that when we need something from the Lord, he's not about to turn us away. So no army, no, no empire, no, no warrior, no, no any of those things, no hosts of, of angels could ever contend with God. And you see, He fights on our side. And He's fighting for us each and every day. And you see, He has all power and authority. And if you can believe tonight that He's able to do all things and that when you call out His name, He's able to meet you where you are. And so if you have a need tonight, though you might feel weak, though you may feel like there's no way out, I know that my God is able. My God is able to answer. My God is able to provide that which you are seeking. See, He's never failed us. As the ladies said this morning that all these testimonies, every one of us has a testimony. And of all the things that God has done for us, we all have great testimonies. And we can look back at all those things that God has done. And we have experienced His power for ourselves. See, just like David as he had so much trust and so much faith in God that he would deliver him out of the hand of Goliath. He was able to have that faith because he saw and he had experienced it for himself. All these things that had happened to him. That God was with him in the time where these lions and, and the bears would come and he would have the strength to overcome them and so we can bring all those things to mind all the things that that God has God has brought us from and delivered us through and we can rely on him today we can trust in his word we can trust in his promises because they're yes and amen hallelujah and so tonight, these altars are open. If you need a touch from the Lord Jesus tonight, have faith to believe that He is able to do it. He's able to make a way where there is no way. He's able to heal. He's able to deliver. He's able to set free. There's no God like our God. There's none like Him. Hallelujah. So as the musicians lead us tonight, we're going to sing a few songs. And if you need prayer this evening, 
why don't you come and, and pastor will pray with you. I'll pray with you. We'll pray together. Don't let this moment pass you by. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God is in this place. We believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. When we seek His face, hallelujah, He's there. The Holy Ghost is moving in this house tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's seek Him this evening. Hallelujah. And let's lift Him up. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father, we are so thankful and grateful, O oh God. Truly, Lord, You are mighty, and You are mighty in battle. Jesus, when we are weak, Lord God, You are strong. And Lord, we might be going through some things right now. A brother or a sister might be going through some things. But we know, Lord God, that You've never failed us before. And You will never fail us and you won't fail us now. And Father, if we just trust in you and rely on you and trust in your word, oh God, you're able to do the, the great and mighty thing. You're able to do the miraculous. And God, I pray that you would make a way out of no way. In, in hopeless situations, in dark times, you're able to make clear Lord God, I pray that you would just touch each heart and each one in this place. God, that you would move upon us, O oh Lord. God, strengthen us, Lord, in these last days, O oh God. Strengthen the weak, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. Strengthen our faith in you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We never forget to give you all the glory and the praise and the, and the honor. Hallelujah. We give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's worship Him. Let's seek Him tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus.